Hello, everybody, and welcome to this lecture on the differentiation of the anemias. This lecture is really primarily targeted towards studying for U.S. Really step one. Um, so take that into mind when you watch this. So first of all, let's talk about some of the basics here. What is anemia? The definition of anemia, anemia actually, if you look it up, is just a, a decrease in any of the red blood cell or hemoglobin uh, values, uh, one or the other. Um, you can see here on the right, these are some of the common values. It really depends on the lab that you're using, um, but usually we look at the hemoglobin. Uh, for men, it's actually a little higher. So men on the lower end, it's 13. Females, uh, if you're under 12, then it's generally thought of as anemia. Uh, and you know, when you when you have a patient with anemia, they're going to be usually they're going to complain mostly of fatigue. Um, sometimes you'll get dizziness, lightheadedness. Uh, pallor, of course, because if they have less blood in them, they're going to not look as red. They're going to look, you know, paler. And shortness of breath can happen if it gets to that point. Well, you just think of it in the sense that if they're anemic, they have less oxygen carrying capabilities. So these are the these are kind of the same type of symptoms you'd see with hypoxia as well. The first step when you have a patient with a low hemoglobin uh, is look at the MCV. What is the MCV? stands for mean corpuscular volume and uh, the mean corpuscular volume is exactly what it sounds like the red blood cell has a shape of a corpuscle right and so the volume of that uh, is the mcv it's measured in femtoliters which is fl and really you should commit this number to memory um, i know on usmle they do give you the standard values it just makes it so much easier it's just 80 to 100 is considered a normal mcv Okay. Uh, under 80 is microcytic. Normal cytic is 80 to 100, which is the normal, like we said. Kind of a mess there, but. And then macrocytic over 100 centiliters. Okay, so that's the MCV. And on this right, you know, one little thing, you're not going to really be expected on the exam to just look at a PBS and say if, if it's micro, normal, or macro. And even, even a pathologist can have trouble doing that. But one little trick you can use here. You can see these look really pale, these RBCs. So this would be what you call a, yes, microcytic, but really hypochromic. And if they're hypochromic, it's generally microcytic. And another trick you can use, if you see a lymphocyte, which is right here, a normal size RBC should really be the size of about the nucleus of a lymphocyte. So you can see that most of these are, are smaller than this nuclei. Okay, now here's the chart that most people will generally use in practice and on the exam uh, to diagnose the cause of the anemia on their patient. And it uses the MCV because that's really kind of the best way to do that. So you look at the MCV, do you have a microcytic? Then you're going to be over here. If you have a normocytic anemia, you're over this, this section right here. And then the macrocytics are over here. Okay, and then you can go down and you follow it. So this video is really going to be meant as an overview, and I'm going to go through each of these sections. We won't go through each individual type in depth. That's going to be for a later time, but we'll talk about each section. Let's first talk about the microcytic anemias. And, you know, the best thing to think about when it comes to microcytic, a microcytic anemia is when you have less RBCs, and the RBCs that you do have are smaller than they should be, right? Because that's what microcytic means. They're smaller. Okay, and really the best way that I like to think about this is they're smaller because something in the RBCs is either missing or it's changed so that it's smaller. Okay, missing or changed so that it's smaller. Now, what is in the RBC that could possibly be missing or changed? Well, the RBC is really, and you know, hemoglobin is exactly what the name is. Hemoglobin is heme plus globin. Okay, so those are really your two options. For when it comes to microcytic anemias. Heme, uh, you don't really think of the actual heme ring, but you think of iron, because iron it binds to heme. The job of heme is to bind iron, and then iron can change the electric properties so that it binds to oxygen. But when you think heme, think iron. Okay, and iron, the most common anemia in general, and especially the most common microcytic anemia, is simply iron deficiency anemia. If you have low iron, uh, you're going to have a smaller RBC, and you're going to have a smaller RBC and less hemoglobin. Um, you know, it is of note that early stages of iron deficiency anemia will actually be normocytic most of the times. Uh, so you can have a normocytic iron deficiency anemia. However, 
uh, the majority of IDAs or iron deficiency anemias are microcytic. So if you have a patient with anemia, uh, if you want to play the odds, it's going to be iron deficiency. Uh, similar uh, iron-based, but uh, you know a different type. We delineate this is anemia of chronic disease. Uh, it's you can also be it, it's, it's also called anemia of inflammation. Uh, but anemia of chronic disease, um, you're not necessarily iron deficient. Okay, anemia of chronic disease is you have some sort of underlying disease state, and it usually is inflammatory. You can see this in patients with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. A lot of autoimmune diseases present with chronic disease. Um, and what happens here is all the iron is basically stuck in the tissues, specifically the hepatocytes in the liver. Uh, it's not actually, you don't actually have uh, iron in the bloodstream. It's stuck in the tissues and it can't be released. So you'll actually have a high ferritin if you look in iron studies. And iron studies is going to be in a different video, but in chronic disease, you actually have storage iron. You do not have uh, the ferrous iron in the blood, okay? So it can't actually be used. And a little tidbit here, uh, sometimes USMLE likes to test this, but lead poisoning as well can cause a microcytic. Because if you recall, lead inhibits a few of the steps in heme synthesis. Um, so that would cause a microcytic anemia. Okay, so those are the heme-based causes. And now when you think of the other side of things, what about globin? Well, there's really one big set of uh, congenital disorders when it comes to globin, and that is the thalassemias. Right? And you can have an alpha or you can have a beta thalassemia. Um, those, are, those are basically just mutations in the globin chain that inevitably cause it to be smaller and you get a microcytic anemia. There's a lot of different kinds of thalassemias. Uh, a little bit of a big topic for this. This video is really meant as an overview. But think thalassemia as well when you see microcytic anemias. Moving on to the normocytic anemias. We have the chart here for normocytic. Um, this has a, a pretty broad differential. Uh, and you know, the best way that I like to think of normocytic anemias, first of all, is, is this a hemolytic process or is it non-hemolytic? Hemolytic meaning, are the RBCs hemolyzing? Are they breaking? Are they shearing, right? So, you know, that's the first step. Determine, is it hemolytic or not? And the ways you can do that is look at your reticulocyte count. Okay, the reticulocyte count is a count of immature young blood cells, red blood cells. So inevitably, if your reticulocyte count is elevated or normal, uh, that means your bone marrow is making new RBCs, okay? It's making new RBCs, because if you think about it, anemia, uh, you can either be losing RBCs or you could just not be making new ones, okay? So if your reticulocyte count is low, then that kind of leads you in the idea that maybe you're just not making new ones, right? And that would be more co uh, that would really mesh more with a non-hemolytic cause. If you have a higher normal reticulocyte count, that means your bone marrow is making more and more, okay, to replace what is being lost. That would kind of point you towards hemolytic, but not necessarily. That's why we have these other kind of lab values. What about haptoglobin? Haptoglobin is a protein in the blood that binds to free hemoglobin. That binds to free hemoglobin. Okay, so if your haptoglobin is low, that means you're probably, you could be hemolyzing, okay? Because if the haptoglobin is low, that means all the haptoglobin in the blood is binding to the free hemoglobin. It's binding to free hemoglobin, and the only way you have free hemoglobin in the blood is from hemolysis. Okay, how about the bile? The bile would be high in hemolytic anemia, right? Because when you're hemolyzing, uh, your heme is broken down to bilirubin in the blood. Free heme is broken down into bilirubin. So if you have excess bilirubin, it could mean that you have excess heme in the blood, which would mean hemolysis. Uh, LDH is lactate dehydrogenase. This is another good marker for hemolysis. Uh, it's an enzyme that's released when RBCs are hemolyzed. So if your LDH is elevated, it could lead you towards hemolysis. And, you know, and it's more not to look at any of these by themselves when distinguishing between non-hemolytic and hemolytic. Use them as a big picture, okay? Combine them, use multiple, and, and really interpret it as a whole. And, you know, kind of one of the gold standards here is if you're hemolyzing, you'll see it on the peripheral blood smear, and that is schistocytes. So schistocytes, this is a schistocyte right here, this is a schistocyte right here. And what those is are literally sheared red blood cells. Okay, they've sheared, they hemolyzed, they've broken open. And if you ever on a pathology rotation uh, and you want to press your 
preceptor, they might ask you what the definition of a schistocyte is on the PBS, and the answer to that is uh, so an RBC with two sharp ends and no central pallor. So you can see here, there's a sharp end here and a sharp end here, and there's no central pallor. This is a schistocyte. So let's talk about the non-hemolytic anemias. Uh, these are kind of pretty easy. Uh, and there's not too big of a differential for the, the non-hemolytic normocytic anemias. Uh, like we mentioned before in the microcytic extension, early iron deficiency anemia or early anemia of chronic disease can cause a normocytic anemia, uh, just because it, it hasn't gotten to the deficient level to where it's actually uh, having trouble producing and keeping the same size of RBC. So early I, IDA and early anemia of chronic disease can cause a normocytic. Okay, and after you after you kind of cross those off your list, well, what else could you be? How could this be happening? Either you're decreasing the production, you're not making as much, or you're somehow losing RBCs. Okay, so the first thing that seems obvious but can be overlooked is acute blood loss anemia. You know, obviously, if you have a patient that comes in with a trauma, it's going to be obvious. But a lot of times, you have patients with GI bleeds it may not be as obvious, and it could be an acute blood loss anemia, right? And you know that can also turn into an iron deficiency. If you're losing enough blood that you're actually losing iron, uh, it could turn into an iron deficiency. And you see that a lot of times in uh, menstruating females, uh, they'll lose uh, blood through menstruation and that'll cause, turn into an iron deficiency. So it actually could start as a normocytic from the acute blood loss, but then over time it, could, it turns into a microcytic because it's turned into an iron deficiency as well. Decreased production, you can always think aplastic anemia. Uh, you're just not making RBCs, right? So that's what that is. And anemia of chronic kidney disease, okay? So how does this actually happen when you have chronic kidney disease? The main mechanism here is EPO, right? So remember, the kidneys uh, secrete EPO or erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to produce RBCs. So if you have kidney dis chronic kidney disease, you'll have decreased EPO, and that'll not stimulate the bone marrow as much. So that's why you see people with chronic kidney disease on dialysis, a lot of times they'll also get EPO shots, EPO supplementation. Uh, and a little good one that can always happen, and we always test this on the wards uh, um, when you have a patient with anemia, is hypothyroidism. It's a really good thing to think of when you have an anemic patient, especially in the elderly. Let's talk about the hemolytic anemias. Now, I like to break them up into the kind of the congenital or acquired really defects versus some other cause, the extrinsic causes. So the, the congenital uh, acquired causes are, are things like hereditary spherocytosis, um, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. These two are a little more rare, but they do show up on boards a lot. They love to test those. I'm not going to go into those in depth, but essentially what you need to know about these is uh, they have to do with defects in the membrane of the RBCs, okay? Um, and that causes a decrease in the, in the uh, uh, it causes anemia, okay? Uh, G6PD is pretty common, okay? G6PD will cause a normocytic anemia. Uh, pyruvate kinase deficiency will cause a normo normocytic anemia. We also you usually see this one more commonly in infants. It's caught earlier generally. And then, of course, sickle cell will cause a normocytic anemia. And sickle cell, of course, has that classic sickling on the, on the peripheral blood smear. And, you know, when it comes to the extrinsic hemolytic anemias, uh, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which is something that you can pick up randomly in the middle in, in midlife and it can you could have it and it could go away later but then it's brought broken down into warm and cold and basically what this means is the warm is exactly what it sounds like when you're in warm warmer environments is when you have the hemolysis uh, and then the, the cold is when you're in if you go outside in the middle of winter somebody with this they might come back and they might be extra pale they might have darker urine because they hemolyze in the cold okay uh, and that is autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Microangiopathic, otherwise known as the the Mahas. Okay. Microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. Okay. And what this basically is, this includes things like TTP, HUS, DIC. Um, it, it has a lot of crossover with the platelet dif dysfunctions. When you have microplatelet clumping and then your RBCs shear over them, uh, then you hemolyze the RBCs from that shear force. And I also put this picture down here. This is a mechanical valve. Uh, 
because these can also cause a maha. Because when, when RBCs go through here, that's mechanical, right? There's there's some sharper edges. It can shear the RBCs and hemolyze them through the valve, okay? So it's always important to keep in the back of your mind, does this person have a mechanical valve when you have somebody with a hemolytic anemia? And last and not least, infection. Infection can do basically anything it wants, but it can cause a hemolytic anemia. All right, let's move on to the macrocytic anemias. Um, the macrocytic anemias also have a pretty broad differential. Um, we're going to try and break this down as simple as possible. The first thing with macrocytic anemias that you want to think of is malignancy, okay? Because it's the most crucial, uh, and that's when you look for your red flag signs. Uh, of course, anemia, when you're thinking malignancy that could lead to anemias, you're thinking of your liquid cancers, leukemia, lymphoma. So what are the big red flag signs? Well, it's kind of the same as your B, your B signs, right? So night sweats, weight loss, uh, things like that, okay? And, you know, another hint you can do, look at the other cell lines. Do you have an extremely low slash high white blood cell count? What about the absolute neutrophil count? Platelets uh, and so forth. So if all three of your all three of your cell lines, your platelets, your RBCs, and your white your white blood cells are down, that could make you think maybe we got to start thinking of malignancy. And these include things like mild dysplasia, marrow failure, or other leukemia lymphomas. Okay. Hemolysis can also cause a macrocytic anemia. Uh, we talked about the hemolyses. Usually it will cause a normocytic, but it can cause a macrocytic, so keep it in the back of your head. And then the other, which is kind of the biggest category, and we'll go into that here. So the big thing that's always taught and tested is your B12 and your folate deficiency. Um, the, the reason this causes a macrocytic anemia is B12 and folate are, are needed for DNA synthesis and management, right? Um, so you, you ha if you're low in these, uh, basically what happens is your, your bone marrow will make RBCs, but because they can't develop, they stay larger and they don't actually develop into the smaller RBCs that normally happens in the, in the life cycle of, of an RBC. Now remember, uh, red blood cells don't have nuclei, so they don't actually go through mitosis and split. That's not what happens. So don't get caught up on USMLE if they try to lead you down the path of, um, oh, it's macrocytic because it's not able to go undergo mitosis. That's not the case. RBCs don't go under mitosis normally. Uh, B12 and folate deficiencies, they can show with neuro findings, dizziness, uh, balance issues is common. Uh, look, at, look for this in vegetarians and vegans because B12 and folate, uh, especially B, B12 especially, is found in meat products. Um, and then, you know, the, the classic thing to look for on the PBS is hyper-segmented neutrophils. Okay, so here we have two neutrophils, and these are certainly hypersegmented. Normally, you have four or less lobes. Um, and you can see here, this one has, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'd say this is one, eight, nine. Uh, and again, a little tip to impress your pathology preceptor, the definition of to, to actually call a PBS hypersegmented is if you have just one neutrophil uh, that has six or more lobes, you can call it hypersegmented, or if you have multiple with five or more lobes, call it hypersegmented. Uh, another little kind of fun tidbit here is I can actually, I would, I'm going to guess and say that this actually smear comes from a female, and this is kind of like a little fun thing because if you look here, this little buddy right here, that's actually a bar body. So remember when the inactivated X chromosome in females, so that's a bar body, so you can kind of think that this is probably a female PBS, which is kind of a cool party trick, okay? Other causes of the macrocytic anemias. Uh, liver disease, alcohol use is always one. Usually this, this happens through vitamin deficiencies, so honestly there's a lot of crossover between this and the B12 folate deficiencies. Thyroid can cause macrocytic as well as microcytic and normocytic. Just always check a thyroid if you're kind of stumped when it comes to an anemia. HIV, you'll learn when you start going on the actual wards and rotations, HIV can basically do anything. <laughs> so always check an HIV if you're stumped for something. Copper and zinc are some elements that we don't really think of in the bloodstream, but they can cause uh, a macrocytic anemia. And then iatrogenic, different types of drugs. You know, there's a few drugs out there that, that will actually lower B12 and folate levels. I think isoniazid and deformin can actually do it as well. So that's usually the mechanism through it, but always review the med list.
And there's three others that I'm not going to go into really big detail here just because they're so rare and they're actually not tested too much on uh, USMLE, erotic aciduria, Fanconi anemia, and then diamond black fan anemia. Okay, and the one the one trick with diamond black fan is these are, if you ever see the picture of the people with uh, really long fingers, almost Marfanoid, um, but they won't have the other the other types and symptoms of Marfan. So if you look up diamond black fan anemia, you'll probably see a picture of really long fingers on a person. Okay. Well, that concludes the lecture on the differentiation of the anemias. I hope this was helpful. Um, again, look out for videos on uh, each of the different types, the micro, the normal, and the macrocytic, where I can actually go into more detail, as well as videos on thalassemia and iron studies. So thank you for listening, and good luck.